Hi everyone, I'm Verity Babs, and in this episode I'm talking to the wonderful David Hughes. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I'm here with the wonderful David Hughes. David, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name's David Hughes. Um, I am mainly a musician, so not really a visual artist, but we're going to talk about art in all its forms, I'm sure. And uh, yeah, I like mainly old music, so music from the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, and I used to do performances of that kind of music and and now I sit at home and think about it and wait for the day I can do that again. <laughs> <laughs> the first image that I'm going to put up on the screen <laughs> is uh, Dora Maar's The Years Lie in Wait for You, um, which you picked. And can you just tell me a bit about why you picked this, how you've come across it, why you like it? Yeah, I picked it because it's like I went in February to the Tate Modern to see this ex an exhibition of Dora Maar's work. And so this was like the last piece of art I saw before lockdown. So that's, or not this, what, there was more than one picture in the exhibition, but like, <laughs> I, I thought this was a good one. Um, and I'd never really heard of her before, but it, she's, got, she was like um, a lover of Picasso's, I think. And like, um, she was a photographer at the start of her career and then later became a painter as well. And she also was one of the first people to really do like fashion photography and photography for magazines as well as artistic photography. That exhibition at the Tate was one of those ones that went on for ages and from the beginning of the exhibition I was like I'll go and see it and then eventually it got to you know December I was like I'll still go and see it and it got to kind of the last few weeks I was like, I'll make sure that I, and I didn't see it so. That was really good. I know I, it's one of those things <laughs> I could tell it was gonna be great and I feel a, I feel a fool. So she's doing advertising photography as well and yeah. the only thing I know about this image from a brief google <laughs> is is that potentially it was going to be an advertising image um, and they think that maybe it would have been for some kind of you know facial serum or something but the idea that you're going to call it you know think about your mortal coil essentially it feels a bit bleak. I really like I think I like the title because like the years lie in wait for you is it like you are going to get old and die or is it you've got a lot more years left to live? Yeah like, actually. I and I can't I don't know I think at first glance it seems quite bleak but then if you think about it it could actually be kind of a positive title I don't know yeah thinking about it, I think my first reaction was oh, oh dear oh dear oh, the yeah. years are coming and they're gonna make you look rubbish <laughs> I think it's interesting as well the the use of the spider because I guess spider has this sort of when you think about spiders and and this is something that they talk about with artists like Louise Bourgeois that spiders you sort of always identify them as female and at the power of the of the female spider and, and the kind of devouring her lovers and stuff. And, and like the Greek myth of like is it Arachne who tries he has the weaving competition with Athena mm. and beats Athena at weaving and then Athena's angry and turns her into a spider. Spiders um, are great. <laughs> but then also I quite like the the imagery for, you know, Lady Spider has a fill, eats 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 the lover, eats the lover spider because Dora Maar, I think, is one of those artists who, like a lot of female artists, one of the first things that is ever associated with her is the fact that she uh, had this love affair with Picasso. Yeah. And so that's why it was really brilliant for her to have this Tate retrospective, um, sort of in her own right. But I do quite like the idea of her making all this art, having a bit of an affair with Picasso, and then just eating him at the end like she's fed up. <laughs> so it's interesting, again, I guess, that you didn't choose an artwork that, fell more into the time category of your your academic background and your musical background I did actually I was down to choosing between two pieces mm. and one of them is like a 17th century painting which I was I was thinking about and it's this piece called um I think it's like man's choice between um virtue and vice or something and it's by this Dutch person called Franz Franken the Younger I just moved to Germany but I lived in Boston for the last six years and I went to the art, the Museum of Fine Arts there a lot because I'm a secondary school teacher and we got in for free all the time. So I just went at the weekend. <laughs> and there's this one big painting. And I realized the reason I love that painting is because it's like got all these devils underneath and all these angels up above and this man in the middle, like being tempted both ways. But the cool thing from my point of view is like all the devils are playing like drums and trumpets and all the angels are playing like harps and violins. So it's like also the sound world of like, the trumpety drummy hell and then the violin-y chorus of harp playing angels in the sky. That's really interesting. So is, there, is in music, is there a sort of 
historical association with things like brass and percussion because I guess you know in the can't think of the date but when like in the dawn of jazz this idea that jazz might be sort of sinful and lure you into vice and this kind of thing is that to do with sort of the heaviness of like percussion and, and brass I think I think there's always been this like people have always been worried that music is going to lead to like immoral things and I think a lot of that has to do with dancing and like if you're dancing with someone to music you know what's what's going to happen and and it's just inevitable yeah you're going to end up having some fun somewhere along the line so I think there's that I think like also the the part of what leads to that differentiation between like drums and trumpets for hell and and harps and violins for heaven is also because like Partly because drums and trumpets were often used by the military. So if you think of like, like on the battlefield, like the drummer boy or like the bugler giving the calls, but also like in those times, like drums and trumpets were like outdoor instruments because they were louder and violins and harps were like indoor instruments because they were quieter. So I think maybe it's just like the devil is louder than God, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I quite like the, like the idea that you'd be tempted by hell because the beat, the beat is better, you know? Yeah, the different different floors of different floors of a club. You're on the cheese floor. And you want to stay there, you know. I think with the Dora Mar, like I don't know, we'll maybe come back to it a few times. It's like a motif. I I think it's really interesting how she's also like in this crossover between commercial art and like fine art, and I think also in music or in other or in like you know in acting and things like that. There's often that uh, sort of tension between like is it serious classical music or is it like music for dancing or is it like a serious play or is it an entertaining TV series? Um, yeah, exactly. And so many artists in the 20th century come from a background of advertising and, th- and then playing off that. So you know, obviously like the big example would be Warhol and people like that, where essentially I'm building you an advert for something, but now it's fine art because I say it is. Um, I think Dora Mara is probably pretty groundbreaking in, in breaching those two. Um, and also she kind of grabs onto surrealism and I think not there aren't enough surreal adverts yeah I th- at the moment when you looked at these photos it was amazing because you're like there's also like quite a lot of nudes um, and like swimsuit adverts and things like that and these kind of like glamour shots for magazines but they're all done in like a really odd way where something is transformed or like there's one of us of a woman bathing in a swimsuit, but like it looks like she's like underwater and maybe dead and stuff. And it's... <laughs> but yeah, I quite like that. There's, there's almost this thing of Dora Mars giving in to the fact that people want to buy stuff that has a naked woman on them. But yeah. then because she's a woman, she's like, I'm going to do something clever with this that you probably won't clock on to, but I will and know that, you know, there's more to it than that. It was like, you know, that's like the early 20th century photography has been around for a little while but it's still like an advertising they're just coming out of like using illustrations to using photography and what can you do with that like overlaying different images or creating like shadows in really you know cool ways which is kind of fun I think. Yeah I like the fact that with photography almost one of the first things that comes out of photography is people doing really mad stuff with it um and even the first photographs that they they take I think one of the first photographs we've got ever is a marble bust because obviously it took ages to take the photographs it's just this marble bust and even that is slightly surreal this sort of now in our visual kind of minds this sort of floating head is quite surreal the exciting thing about photography is they kind of you know obviously you can take images of things as they kind of are visually yeah and it's interesting how quickly people were like but I want to do something mad with it (laughs) I think it's I think photography has that weird aspect of being like you always think oh because it's a photo it must be really like that Mm. you know and it's just like now it you know it's all about instagram filters or like shaping your face in a certain way or whatever and you think oh because it's a photo it must be really like that but it's not Uh, one of the things i struggle with photography is one of the things i never studied at all and i just want to say neither did i yeah (laughs) Like, we don't know anything at this yeah. point. Just, you know what, I, I am a big believer in having opinions about stuff you don't know about. Yeah. Um, in the, all these opinions may be wrong. <laughs> yeah. Disclaimer, believe nothing. 
um in that i find it difficult sometimes to work out where photography sits in the line of like where it sits amongst things like uh, the composition that a painter comes up with and the composition that someone who's doing a drawing comes up with because there is an element of you just have what's in front of you and you have to make of that what you will yeah. so I sort of that's something that I'm interested in thinking about more at the moment is how where kind of photography sits on the line of artistry I guess but then when you have people like Dora Maar doing layers and photo montages and then you have lots of people doing collage with photography and that kind of thing I think that's where that kind of really comes into play because we also exist in a really weird world as you say with Instagram where everyone can like be a photographer because they've got a camera on their phone but that isn't necessarily the same thing as being an artist it's not necessarily the same thing as being a photographer you know yeah I feel like maybe we've lost a bit of maybe what now the situation is with photography of like it's it's kind of it's, it's as much documentary as it is artistic right it's like a record keeping or you know this is how things are in the newspapers like this is what things look like but I think before photography invented like drawing and painting also had that role and you'd be like oh this is the portrait of the king this this is like how we tell people what the king looks like because yeah. we don't have photographs right so it's like maybe photography we experience photography now in a way that people may have experienced painting like 200 years ago or something and even and even with even with paintings at that point which would have had this sort of creative license like this is what heaven and hell look like that there was such a purpose of we're going to put this in the church so that the people who can't read and write know what heaven and hell looks like so they know that you know h- hell is bad you can see the people kind of having pitchforks stuck into them and this kind of thing and you know that heaven is good because you can see that jesus is up there so the idea of the altarpiece in the church is almost a sort of oppressive thing for for the illiterate to be like, you might not understand, like, you might not be reading Bible verse, but this is to this is evidence. This is essentially a photograph of what's going to happen to you if you, you know don't follow scripture. This yeah. Kind of thing. And then and then bringing it back to like the advertising thing, and then in those altarpieces you'll have like the two the two random like non biblical figures praying at the foot of the cross in the bottom left and then you're like oh that's a portrait of the guy who paid for this and his wife um yes I love them they're so good it's it's not just this it is also this like branding of that noble family being like oh yeah this noble family is great they paid for this altarpiece and look they're really close to Jesus in the picture yeah and then there there are often altarpieces where they're they fold out but when you close them, then there is the portrait of, you know, the, the lady, the lady oh. of the manor and her husband. Yeah, kind of who who owns who owns religion in that sense. And that is, you know, old time advertising because, you know, well, it's um, Henry VIII's second wife or fourth wife. I can never remember who looks really fit in the in the painting. Oh, is this but, the Anne of Cleves one? Yeah, where she look where she looks like a fitty in the, in the painting and then he's and he's disappointed but you know if that's what you got to work with you know you gotta you gotta advertise baby like that's a weird one because the painting is essentially like the sales brochure for this new wife for the king right mm. they're like hey henry why not check out this model here's yeah hey, this could be yours for just three short payments spread over <laughs> old months or whatever it is and just then... four four short sacrifices of other wives yeah. <laughs> These are things I should have learned at one point. Yeah. I should try and learn, but instead, well, I won't. Yeah, and I love that about lockdown. You're like, I could learn this. I could do that. <laughs> no, I'm going to sit on my computer and kill other people in an imaginary world. For- <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> yeah, we, we, you know, we all had that. We had this opportunity to kind of, you know, learn about ourselves and, you know, really, really think about, you know, what makes us tick, what, what we need in our lives. And everyone was like, nope. I'm making sourdough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna make bread. Yeah, maybe it's cooking an art. That's another, you know, that's another thing. Like on MasterChef, they're always like, "Oh, cooking is my art." Yeah. I think, yeah, it's, it's difficult because there is so much stuff that is that is visual that isn't necessarily an art form. I mean, in our in our school, we had we had food tech. Yeah, but we... the problem was was that in case you were in case you poisoned. The teacher, the teacher wasn't allowed to taste what you'd made, um, so they could just they just judged it on 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 its like aesthetic. On, I remember it being on design, like I remember making a pizza and we had to like 
beforehand draw out the pizza and like put like the salami goes here yeah <laughs> it goes here and you're like who is like what is yeah but there's just such a massive <laughs> flaw in the idea that it can be beautiful but it can also be completely inedible I came home once with a quiche that we made <laughs> that had got brilliant marks so I'd, you know put some put some basil on it or something and it looked very pretty but when I got home I cut into it there was a <laughs> I cut into it there was a whole kitchen knife in there that at some point I dropped into the into the batter of this that's key like, that's a great way to steal stuff exactly I like, you can steal stuff from any kitchen just go in take a quiche and put like <laughs> whatever you want to take inside and then smuggle it out the quiche burglar it the, strikes again the quiche burglar I wonder if, the, or you could like imagine if you baked like a pie that had like a false bottom, like, and then you could hide like a message in there and send it as a spot, like you know, like in a Graham Greene novel, like, oh, I've got the pie in now, or like in one of those escape movies from Colditz, and you like open up the bottom and there's your yeah. Map. It'd have to be it'd have to be a plan that you knew about in advance because you wouldn't want to be like, what a delicious pie, thanks for sending it, and they're like, did you like, did you get the the information like? Well, I got a delicious pie. You, you said I gave you those emergency uh, arsenic pills in the pie. <laughs> right? You didn't eat them, did you? Well, <laughs> well, well I always worry about mix-ups when you see all those the the brilliant spy kit people had in in the early twentieth century, where it's like it's a lipstick, but actually it's a bomb. <laughs> you don't want to mix up in mix up in. You want to like keep all your stuff to yourself, right? <laughs> you, you don't want to be. Just like, oh, can I borrow your? Uh, can I? Can I just borrow your uh, your fountain pen? Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, if anyone ever asks Batman to use anything that he owns, he's like, no, I'm really sorry, you can't. But, but I just need to. I just need to use your pen. He's like, you, you can't. I can't explain why, but you can't. That's probably why Batman doesn't have any friends. Oh. It's like probably easier to just not have any friends than to have to awkwardly say that they can never <laughs> use your stuff. The day when you would be like, oh my goodness, I didn't see it in the cinema. I have to wait 18 months until it comes out on VHS. Ah, <laughs> oh, the past. Well, that's the problem. Now I've missed Dora Maar. There's no, there's, she's not going to get put on DVD, is she? Oh no, but like, you can see like all of the photos on the internet. Yeah, that is the benefit. That's the weird thing about like going to see an art exhibition of photos. It's like, because when it's paintings, there's just one of that painting. Mm. But when it's a photo that was on the cover of a magazine, you're like, how do they choose which one to put in the show, right? There's probably like 10,000 copies of this photo. Yeah, oh. and I guess also, you know, obviously there's a difference between what, like looking at a painting on a screen and looking at a painting in real life because there is this sort of like textual element and this kind of thing. And I think we really often forget that photographs are a 3D object and they have, they do live this life and they, you know, they are touchable and you know, which obviously not not in the no, exhibition space. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer: Do not do this. Um, but then, but then there is also that thing of: Am I getting the same effect looking at each piece online as I would be in the exhibition? Obviously, the experience is different because you haven't got this kind of onslaught of of content like you have in a gallery. And also, like I think there's something important about when you're in the gallery, and this is what's going to be difficult now: is like being there with other people and it, it's similar to being in a in the theater or something in that you are an audience experiencing this collectively and like I went with two other people to this particular exhibition so you know we're talking about the photos and stuff as mm. we go around and and then there's this kind of like there's this sort of collective speed at which people move through the exhibition and like most people move at roughly the same speed and like you're like I saw you in the first room and now we're both in the second room and, and then you're like you're at the gift shop at the same time <laughs> and, um, and it's like yeah there's something collective about it which you can't necessarily have if you're just if you're like looking at paintings on the internet. Essentially we're allowed into the art gallery as floating brains ideally we'd be invisible floating brains that could go around and look at the stuff and not get in anyone's way not you know be wearing anything that is like distracting from the colours of the art, you know, not making any noise. So actually your physical form is sort of just has to be allowed to get your brain and eyes in. I went to see the William Blake exhibition at the Tate Britain that was just absolutely 
packed full of people so you you had you hadn't got any choice about what you saw you saw what there where there was a gap <laughs> and you saw what yeah. was in the gap and then you waited for the conveyor belt of people to kind of move around the room and you saw it, things in that order um and I haven't got a very good concentration span so normally in an exhibition I'm kind of in and out in 20 minutes and sort of dashing about I really ought to take longer but I just get a brain overload get, get a bit tired get a bit sleepy but I so one thing so going back to like the the other painting that's in the Boston gallery the cool thing was like I only found out this year that teachers like get into this gallery for free all the time mm -hmm. I was like why did I not know about this for the other five and a half years of <laughs> city but then I went like three or four weekends in a row just on Saturday went there and because it's free you can just go in and you don't feel the need to like see to spend like four hours there and see everything so I go in for like 45 minutes or an hour and just see like a few things each time and it was so much nicer because yeah. you, you, you do get to that point where you're like I can't really like take in another painting or another sculpture or another thing my feet hurt yeah like when you first go in like there's the silence and the footsteps on the floor and you're like this is a great atmosphere and then after about two hours you're like too quiet and weird <laughs> yeah I like, don't like it anymore. you get that urge where you're like maybe I should just sh shout <laughs> it's amazing like even though so they have like the thing where if you put your hand over the line it goes beep right but no people just generally don't we're so well trained we all we all like go in and there's no one telling you to do anything and no signs that say please be quiet and move around slowly and don't touch anything but everyone knows what to do and everyone's just like Read the well, that's, well yeah, that's why there, there, there are those examples when you know people put down a, a can of coke on the floor and everyone keeps a meter away from it and looks at it and you know we've been trained as to what you do in a gallery and it's only ever kind of children having to be told you know you don't put your hand over the line or you know you don't you'd not touch anything and yeah and all those and then you think like with both those paintings we were, the painting and the photo we we're talking about like the painting originally would have been like in someone's private house and like only like the people in that family and their guests would get to see it and they could do whatever they want in front of it and then the photograph if it's in a magazine like people would just like pick it up toss it aside you know go sit on the loo and look at it and, <laughs> and like it's so the gallery is so it's so divorced from it's, it's such a it's in a way a very odd way to experience most of these things mm. right well, yeah, when, when people you know chip banksies off the wall and put them in a gallery space or yeah. it's, it's really not the point you know and um I remember going to Shoreditch and there are a lot of original banks there that are covered in um bulletproof glass so that you can't draw over the top of them you can't try and get them off and the idea of what you know proper look proper looking and like formal looking at stuff in the gallery space that does disrupt a lot of how we actually view things and that you know putting photographs in the gallery like I was saying denies it of that three-dimensional life that it actually does have and the cool thing of course about photos is you can make 10,000 copies of it and everyone can have the exact same thing and like you can just have that art object in your house whenever you want for not very much money right and that's really cool yeah I have so I whenever I go to an art, art fair or something I always kind of try and pick myself something up you know 30 quid or something um but then I feel I feel like I can't look at it until I framed it so I have a I have a box full of yeah. things that I'm about to frame but I don't let myself look at them because I've been trained that you know that it would be completely sacrilegious to get this out and like blue tack it to the wall I have to get it framed and mounted and this is kind of this idea that that's the respect that fine art deserves which is sort of a fallacy anyway but I just sort of there's this box of like neglected art because I'm like no it's not proper I haven't recreated the gallery space yet you know but then I I have some things like framed that are not originally art, just like little squiggly doodles that people have done that I liked or whatever that friends have done. And then you put them in a frame and then it's like it becomes proper in a way, right? Mm -hmm. This little squig someone did this doodle on a post-it and I liked it and then you put it in a frame and it's like, oh now it's a proper piece of art. Do you think that works in the same way in like let's say theatre or music where is it where if you like like if you have this certain set of actions but it's happening on a stage rather than in the street mm. like does that make it theatre 
I feel like in those forms it works a bit differently because the theatre, like, it's not the real thing. It's people pretending to do stuff. Mm. I feel like theatre far more than visual art is sort of forgiven for, you know, when it's not very good or when it's not particularly, like, professional or... Well, the same thing, you know, all libraries have all the books, regardless mm-hmm. of whether they're good. And and art galleries do not do that. Um, and theatre, I suppose, you know, having spent time with The Fringe... <laughs> a, a, yeah, like a, a, a big production is as much theatre as a you know a play that's been put on by three students from from a university so there isn't that kind I don't think there's necessarily that kind of division of like hierarchy Mm. I wonder why that is though do you think do you think like over the times you know theatre makers or musicians have been more successful in breaking down that barrier or have or is it that like visual art people have been more successful in erecting it I don't know. I think potentially it does come back to this whole, you know, my five year old could have done that thing where uh, not many people think that they are brave enough to get on stage and perform something. Yeah. And not and the same thing with music. You know, not many people think that they are good enough at an instrument to be able to get up in front of people and, and perform. But a lot of people think that they could have, you know, filled in some circles and made a Damien Hurst. Yeah. So maybe there is that level of skill becomes involved and that's why I think photography has really suffered because if you reduce photography to like well you just click a button and then you've made you've made it you've made a photograph that's why I think maybe that has suffered in terms of how we view fine art and kind of people are potentially more likely to be impressed by an oil painting that has taken weeks to do and is very realistic in how it's portrayed you know a portrait or a landscape they're far more impressed by that than they are about conceptual modern art where the canvas is just painted black. And they're probably even more impressed by the canvas painted black than they are by a photograph because at least with the canvas painted black, you've had to get out a paintbrush. So I think this idea of sort of fallacy of skill Mm. probably comes into it, maybe. What a massive question that we'll never be able to answer. Probably solve it in the next five to 10 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) I don't I, you know. It's something to ruminate on. I, it's the lockdown time is like a really strange time to be a performing artist, right? Because like as much as you can do um, stuff on the internet or share videos and stuff, it's not really the same. And will vi- does visual art suffer the same way, right? Does mm. does visual art need exhibitions in the same way that theatre needs performances? I don't know. It's difficult because I guess artists potentially more and more are making art that they can photograph well to put on Instagram because Instagram is such a important sales tool for them. And lots of places are doing online exhibitions, but I don't think that will take over from real performances. I mean, people are still creating stuff because I guess you can create art without anyone watching you. You sort of can't create theatre without anyone being there to watch, mm. I suppose. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think we've smashed it. <laughs> okay. We solved art. That's great. Pick. <laughs> well, thanks so much, David, for uh, having this chat with me. Where can people hear from you? Great. They can hear from me if you go to my website, which is davidwilliamhughes.org.com was taken. Then you can see that I don't have any upcoming performances. But you can also search David William Hughes on YouTube. And like that's probably the place where most likely some things will appear in the, uh, in the next days or like i also exist on facebook and twitter and instagram at la serva padrona which was going to be my new show but still will be just maybe a year or two from now (laughs) thanks so much for watching uh please do share this about and you can follow david in the way it's written below and you can follow me at verity babs art on instagram thanks